Good morning. Welcome to church. Welcome to MSNF Online Church this morning, Sunday 6th of September. Welcome wherever you're watching from, whoever you're watching with, whenever you're watching. Welcome. We're glad that you can join us today. Where am I? Well, Ferry Denners and Montrosians won't need a second guess. But for those of you who are further away, I'm out at Skirdiness Lighthouse, on the point of the, where the land meets the sea, on the point where the South Esk runs into the sea. A lighthouse that is put here to warn shipping of these rocks that I'm standing on, the, the rocks that sta rise steeply up from the, the bed of the sea and that have been a danger to shipping. Uh, from ever, ever since there was a harbour in Montrose that and the sands of the Annet Bank opposite have uh, seen uh, several ships over the years uh, run aground and, uh, and run into problems. So Lighthouse, yes, a warning. But I've been struck ever since a talk by uh, Mike Close a few weeks back now about the nature of lighthouses. They're not just warnings. Yes, they're placed there to warn ships of the dangers. Uh, the Bell Rock out in the, in the Forth there. Not the Forth, out in the Tay, way out there. Uh, and, and others like it. But they also act as directional beacons. They, they're, they're a marker on the map, so to speak. Each lighthouse having its own code, its own um, signal that folk at sea can recognise where they are and where they're heading. I can imagine many a night where fishermen have been out on that sea and been glad to see the light of Skirdiness as their beacon home, knowing that they're on their way home. And of course, Mike likened that to Jesus being our light, uh, not just the light of our lives, lighted up our lives, but light in the sense of our direction, our beacon in times of trouble. So yes, we're here thinking about Jesus guiding us, leading us, empowering us. But first this morning, let's go to uh, church family celebrations. We have a busy list of church family celebrations uh, today. First up is Anna, who has a 21st birthday actually today. So happy birthday, Anna. Have a great 21st birthday. Next is uh, Gaz. Gaz is Chris Brown's son. Uh, he's 35 during the week. So happy birthday, Gaz. Hope you had a great day. And uh, that's the birthdays, but we have a golden wedding anniversary, Tom and Christine Easton. Uh, so congratulations on your 50 years together, Tom and Christine. Hope you're, uh, and that's today as well. So have a great celebration. And finally, and by no means last, a new job, a new job for Carson. Not just a new job, but her first ever job at Chicken Monkeys. And she's really looking forward to it. So congratulations, Carsten, on landing that job. And all, all, every blessing as you get to grips with it as well. And of course, there's only one song we could sing while we're out here. My lighthouse, my Jesus, my lighthouse. You are my peace in the tr my troubled sea.
God, we thank you for this new day. We thank you for the opportunity to come together as one to meet with you. Even though we are each in our own homes, we are joined together by our love for you and for each other. We praise you, God, for all the good things we have, the safety of our homes, provision for all our needs, the beauty of all your creation around us. We thank you for good friends, people who are always there to support us when we feel lost or lonely or afraid, friends who are always by our side. And we thank you because you are our best friend and you have promised in your word that you will never leave us. Lord, you have given us so much and still you give more. We are living in unpredictable times, times of worry and stress on many levels, so we turn to you even more for peace and reassurance. May we learn to trust you more each day, laying all our worries at your feet. We know that church as we know it may never be the same again, and we ask that you give us wisdom and patience as we work through the coming weeks and months of change. Jesus, when you rose from the dead, a new church began. Your disciples waited with anticipation, some trepidation, and I'm sure too, great excitement at what was about to happen. Lord, may your Holy Spirit move us to feel this same level of excitement as we wait to see how the new church of today changes and develops. Awaken our spirits, Lord, to be ready to embrace the changes about to come. We are a chosen people and we cannot wait to be part of what happens next. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And now let us say together the prayer Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. I've just been out for a walk. I read the scripture passage that I'm about to read to you just as I was leaving the house. And in just about every field I passed on my walk, there were either combines or balers hard at work, collecting in the harvest from the seeds that were sown a few months ago and grew with God's input, growing into the harvest for today. Some years have a good harvest, other years not so good, but that doesn't stop the farmer from sowing more seed next year. So as I walked round, I thought about seeds and God's work and harvest. Jesus sowed the seeds in the disciples and they grew and ripened with God's input up to their being harvested at their first Pentecost. And they then went and sowed seed and with the benefit of God that was harvested and down through all the generations. And so to this year. Has it been a good year? More people watching online services? or a bad year, because all we can think of is the virus. But now, as we start 
to look at restarting services in church. And as the Growing Young initiative kicked off for real on Wednesday evening with the first proper webinar, are we ready to sow the seeds of faith again and watch God's hand at work where we sow? That seed of faith in the first disciples grew until it matured at, at Pentecost. So now we turn to the scripture. Jesus has met the two disciples on the road to Emmaus and revealed himself to them by breaking bread. And the disciples then ran all the way back to Jerusalem to tell the other disciples. And now I start reading from Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, starting at verse 36. Listen for the word of God. Listen with your ears and with your mind and with your hearts. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood amongst them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they did, still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so, they, so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witness of all these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven, and they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, we're back to thinking about what sort of church, what sort of church are we to be after this period of lockdown? after we've been shut out of our buildings, what sort of church are we going back to be? I've heard a lot, uh, I and mean, not just a lot, it keeps hitting me in these times. Uh, I'm doing, God is saying, I'm doing a new thing. Behold, I do a new thing. Or Revelation, uh, that's Isaiah 43, and then in Revelation, I think it's 5, it says, I make all things new. God's a creator, a recreator. He's created us in his image. He's created us to be creative. But what sort of church is it that God wants us to be? That's what we're thinking about in some of these talks. And we began in 1 John, chapter 4, and we began with the very nature and character of God. God is love. So there's a church that's founded on God's love. A church where the love of God flows through the people. Where the people know the love of God and where the people share the love of God. That's one aspect. But then later in 1 John chapter 4, it, John tells us how God shows his love for us. He sent his one and only son to be our saviour. Jesus came and died and rose again. So there's a church that knows the salvation of Jesus Christ, lives in it, walks in it, knows it. 
and shares it. And today we turn to, well even before the early church, to the end of the gospel, to the end of the gospel story or the end of Jesus' life or flesh life, shall we say, on this earth. In Luke chapter 24. And to the beginnings, the, the, the early beginnings of the church, even before it began, the instructions they received and what they were to do. And Jesus appears to his disciples. This is after the resurrection. This is after he appears to the two on the way to Emmaus. He appears to the disciples and he... And they were startled and terrified, wouldn't you be? The man you saw on a cross, the man you saw die on a cross, appear alive in front of you. You, you laid him in the tomb. You knew he was dead, stone cold dead. Yet he appears in the room. You're fearful of the Roman authorities and more. But he stands amongst them and says, Be at peace. And here's a remarkable bit. If you ever doubted the divinity of Christ, he says, I am the living God. Oh. And don't be afraid. And he asked them to touch him and, uh, and, and, yeah, just to see that he is body and flesh and bone. Showing him his hands and his feet. And he asked for a piece of fish, which he ate. Then he teaches them about the words that he spoke to them. That all the, everything that was said in the prophets would be fulfilled. Come to fulfillment. And in that moment, in, in the Passion Translation, it says, in that moment, he supernaturally unlocked their understanding to re receive the revelation of Scripture. You know, throughout the Gospels, sometimes, but particularly Mark's Gospel, but throughout the Gospels, the disciples are a bit dim-witted at times. They don't quite understand what is happening and what is coming and w w what's before them. But suddenly in this moment, they understand and they see. And he gives them a task. He gives them a task. That task. Now you must go into all the nations and preach repentance and forgiveness of sins so that they will turn to me. Whoa. Who are these men? Fishermen, tax collectors. Eleven, eleven of them. Ordinary folk. And here's their mission to go into all the world. Repeat and preach repentance and salvation. Where do you start with a task like that? How do you go about it? What do you say? Who do you say it to? And a fearful at the moment. Roman authorities are on the back. The the high priest and his cohorts are on their back. They're fugitives. But they've got this job to do. Remember what Jesus says at, at the beginning of this? I am the living God. The task is given them by God himself. And you know what? Down through the generations, down through the church, that's our task too. Yeah, we call it mission and we call it evangelism and uh, we kind of run away from that, don't we? 
uh, not me, uh, I don't know what to say. They won't hear me if I do say it. I'll get ridiculed. Folk won't be my friends anymore. Uh, I'm not equipped. I don't know enough. I haven't been to Bible college. I haven't been to theological school. I haven't got a degree in divinity. Now, a minister can do that. Just as a minister can do everything else. In some cases. Not always here. Yeah, so a big task. Where do you start? And you know what Jesus says? Start right here in Jerusalem. Right where you are. There's a point in my call that I thought about going overseas. The mission field was Africa or Nepal or India or somewhere overseas. But you know what? It's also at home. The mission field is wherever you are. And yes, we explored Africa, we explored different things. But the end, God said, Scotland is where you are to minister. And so we came back home. But mission is here. Your mission, your task of preaching forgiveness of sins starts where you are and where's that? amongst family amongst friends, amongst work colleagues on the street serving, helping at the food bank helping at Philos So, maybe that's the third thing we need to know about the church. Founded in God's love, centered on Jesus Christ and his salvation, but tasked with a mission to go and tell. Simple terms, it's about being witnesses. Let's take that word evangelism out of it for a moment. Let's take that word mission out of it for a moment. Essentially, you are a witness. And you witness in your everyday life. So this new church, which wasn't even called a church at this point, wasn't even called Christian at this point. This new church had a task to do. A task to start where they are. And that's where our task starts. That's MSNF Church. What sort of church are we to be? We have a mission. And it starts here in Ferry Den and in Montrose. But that's not all. That's not all. Start right here in Jerusalem. That's fair enough. Start where you are. For you are my witnesses. I think we've covered that. You are witnesses to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the hope that brings and the, the love that, that, that's available to people through it. The salvation. He says, and I will send you a fulfillment of the Father's promise to you. So stay here in the city until the mighty power of heaven falls upon you and wraps around you. Stay. you got a mission. you got a task. Don't start yet. Wait. 
we know, looking forward a wee bit, that on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out in power upon those disciples, they were in prayer in, in an upper room. How did they spend those days waiting? Well, I suspect they spent it in prayer, seeking God, holding fast to the promise, waiting for Him. Stay in the city. Well, that's a word, though the word wait has been with me throughout lockdown. Wait on me. What are we to do, Lord? Who are we to be? How are we to do it? What's worship going to be like? What's, well, what's anything going to be like? And God says, wait on me. Wait. Isaiah 40, it's those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They'll run and not grow weary. They will rise up on wings like eagles. Soar on wings like eagles. It's a magnificent day out here today. The vista is fantastic. It's a bit breezy. And the waves are rolling in on the rocks in front of me. Oh, but what would it be like to be up there? Soaring on wings like eagles. With their acuteness of vision. Seeing the land, seeing the people. As God sees it. But there's more to this waiting. They're to wait until the mighty power of heaven falls upon you and wraps around you. Paul writing to the Ephesian church says that the, the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is available to you. I don't know what sort of power brings a body back to life. What sort of power transforms that body while it's still flesh and bones but can appear in a locked room. There's probably no about the Turin Shroud, how true it is or not, I don't know, but it's said that it's uh, uh, the, the, the shroud, the, the, the linen that wrapped Jesus' body when he was laid in the tomb and that the power of the resurrection burnt his image onto the cloth. Like a, a flash of light will burn an image onto a photographic plate. I don't know about the Turin, Turin Shroud, whether it's uh, its legend is right or not, but it's that sort of power that raises the dead from life. I think it's more than the power of lightning that rolls across the sky. I think it's more than the power of the greatest winds that we have imagined. I think it's more than the power of the rushing waves. But Paul says that that same power is available to those who believe. And here Jesus says, wait until the mighty power of heaven falls upon you. What might a church be like that moved in that power? What might a church people be like? They knew the power of God in that way. We have to look at a wee bit of the life of Jesus. He taught with authority. He healed the sick. He cast out the demons. He freed people from 
the repression. He turned lives around from hopelessness and despair to what life and vitality to joy. Where are the people in your life at the moment that could do with a little bit of that life and vitality and joy? So that's the third element, isn't it? We talked a little while, we said third was the mission, but really the third is this. The first is the love of the Father. Founded on the love of the Father. Church that's founded on the love of the Father. The second is a church with Jesus the Son at its heart, knowing and walking in his salvation. And the third is this, a church that is a people clothed in the power of God, walking in his grace, walking in his love, seeing, seeing God at work in the little everyday details of life, answers to prayer, God incidences in front of us. So I believe that's the church that God wants and we'll move on in another week time to look at Acts chapter 2 and that gift of the Holy Spirit and how it transformed those disciples into leaders and preachers and healers. The lives that they would see transformed around them. And how is that they walked in those three things the Trinity of Father, Son and Holy Spirit that the church grew and expanded and indeed went into all the world for now shall we pray come Holy Spirit fill us with the Father's love Give us that sure and certain knowledge of our salvation in Jesus Christ, your Son. And send us out in your power to share the love that we know and the joy that we have in our salvation. In Jesus' name. Amen.
teach me thy way. Until the race is run, until the journey's done, until the crown is won, teach me Lord Jesus, you have said in your word, always pray and never give up. You were always praying when you were here on earth. In fact, you are still praying for us in heaven. What an honour and privilege. We bring our prayers to you today for our world and those here at home. We pray for all those imprisoned for loving and serving you. We pray for those in prison camps in North Korea who face cruelty and deprivation. May you honour them with your grace and courage as they face each day. We pray for protection for underground networks of believers in Saudi Arabia, Somalia and China. May they be aware of your presence and comfort for them. We pray for workers in countries where COVID-19 infections are still very high. For strength for those on the front line, nurses, medics, cleaners, porters, and ambulance drivers. Lord God, here at home, give our leaders wisdom and integrity as they make decisions in difficult and unprecedented times. May we never lose hope in you, thanking you, Heavenly Father, that you have promised to give us strength to lift us up when we are weak and to give us light when things look dark and bleak. Help us as a church family to reach out to our community that we might be a blessing, being encouraging and helpful. Fill us with your compassion and may we truly know your grace being sufficient for us. For all those in our own families, those struggling, those unwell, and those younger members going back to school, college and university, may you help them to fulfil their potential and know your protection in a world full of complexities and opportunities. We bring all our prayers to you. In the strong name of Jesus, our Saviour, Counsellor and Mighty Redeemer. Amen. Nations are slipping
Here we are at the end of another service, another time of gathering around computers and TV sets and mobile phones, tablets, however you watch this, or a telephone if you're listening on the line. Scared an S behind me, I really enjoyed my time out here this afternoon, the sun shining, but the wind is blowing, but it's a beautiful afternoon. May Jesus Christ, the rock of our salvation, be the rock of your salvation. May Jesus Christ, be the light in your darkness. May Jesus Christ, be the love that you need to know. Now let's join in that grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. The people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.